Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and my special guest today is Richard Tabin. Richard is a fellow Rotarian, a lifelong Beverly resident. And I have to say, Richard, that you, you think you know a person like you are in Rotary with me. Uh, Richard has written a book. And when I read the book, I was just blown away. And uh, for our viewers, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a teaser about some of the stuff that's in the book and some of the things we're going to talk about. Now, one of the first things I learned is that, Richard, you, Richard is descended from someone who came over on the Mayflower, correct? Correct. Um, and then Richard's ancestry also includes a couple of Puritan woman, women uh, who were involved in some, uh, some of the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, controversy uh, regarding Puritans and religion. And she was hanged during colonial times. Um, and uh, your father, who despite having rheumatic fever and almost dying when he was young, uh, was mustered into the army and served in World War II and fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And you are a competitive runner, which you have been since uh, uh, since middle school. Right. And we're going to talk a little bit about who your coach was there because he's a dear friend. And I must say that you com you were competing in the 2013 Boston Marathon. He was nearing the finish line. And what happened? But there was two terrorist bomb explosions. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then Richard ran for uh, public office here in Beverly for, for city council. And now he's written a book. And <laughs> you, you'd think that you didn't have enough to write about, huh, Richard? So this is a copy of Richard's uh, book, uh, still running after all of these years, still running after all these years. And there's Richard on the front, right in, uh, on Boylston Street uh, right. at, at, at the end of the, of the marathon. Well, Richard, welcome. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. And... Um, I think uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, and you have a lot of pictures in your book. So, um, first of all, let me ask you: um, why why write a write a book now? You're you're over sixty. Why write a book now? I think what happened was I, originally I was going to write a book about the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing, and what happened was I was writing it, and there's a friend of mine named Linda Judd, and she was a um, English professor at, at one of the community colleges. And she read the, um, the manuscript and she says, Rich, you, you have a lot more to say than just about the marathon. And I just felt very strongly. I mean, I've never written a book before. I'm an accountant by trade. I've never written anything like this. Yeah. And I decided I wanted to have a really straightforward, honest book about growing up in Beverly. Yeah. And also, I, when I ran the marathon, I really wasn't figuring on running the marathon in 2013. I thought my last marathon would be 1996 Boston Marathon, the 100th. But what happens? My running club got numbers for the marathon and through volunteering. So now you also de uh, dedicated the book to your my mother? yeah. I dedicated to both our sets of parents, but yeah. I think mainly to my mother and my father. Yeah, tell um, us a little bit about your mom. My mom had something called Sturgey Weber syndrome. Mm -hmm. and we didn't realize that she actually had a wine stain that went right down her face, down to her chest. Yeah. And what we found out when I was growing up, I was kind of embarrassed by her because she was disabled. And at that time, people didn't really care for dis disabled people. It was back yeah. in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And uh, what happened was uh, she, um, I, my, two th I, I found out from one of her doctors when I was in my, um, like around 19, um, but before the 2013 marathon, I found she had something called Sturgey Weber syndrome. Yeah. Sturgey Weber syndrome only goes from 1 in 50,000 births. And what it does, it's not just a wine stain. One side of your brain is yeah. a different size than the other. And she actually had polio when she was a child. Wow. And she was also, she grew up in Montreal and she came from a very successful family. And I think they were kind of embarrassed by her. Yeah. I mean, they wouldn't say that, but her sister married a doctor. Another, another brother was a stockbroker. Her yeah. father was a vice president for Sun Life of Canada. So they grew up pretty well off and like my father's side of the family. Yeah. And uh, so what happened was she, uh, she didn't finish high school, but she decided to come down to Boston on her own back in the 1950s. And she worked at, I think, George Marsh, one of the apartment stores in Boston. My dad was a World War II vet, when he, he, and he came from uh, Maine, I mean, originally from Maine, and he came down to go to school under the GI Bill. And what happened was he met her, and they fell in love and got married. Yeah. 
and your mom. So through through your mom's adversary and everything really in life being thrown against her, you learn that perseverance and that and that ability to to fight through, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> she went through a lot, and I mean, she uh, when she she had strokes and she had a. Uh, paralysis later in her life yeah. and she had uh, epilepsy later in her life and my dad took care of her and I think I mentioned in the book that yeah. he actually uh, he uh, actually found out she's going to go to a nursing home and he dropped dead two days later yeah yeah. I mean so yeah. it's really yeah. a very, incredible story very, very touching yeah. yes yeah. so now let's let's look at I'm going to ask Zach in our control room to put up uh, picture number one and tell us who this is I believe it's John or this is a uh, a certificate uh, and this is John Holland. And tell us about the certificate, uh, Richard. Okay, what it is is that we will have to apply for a uh, from from the Mayflower Society, the Mayflower Descent Society, to get a, get actually get a, a certificate like this. And it's very difficult. You have to prove your line all the way down. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, there was one problem we had because my uh, grandmother was born in Los Angeles, California, in 1890. We didn't have her. Los Angeles didn't have records at that time. Uh -huh. But they still took it. I mean, I'm actually related to five Mayflower families. Yeah. And this is the one that was the easiest one to prove. Yeah. It's through my grandmother. So you have this, and you are a <clears throat> descendant of uh, of John Howland, uh, who came over on the on the Mayflower. Now, also in in terms of your ancestry, let's let's look at uh, number four, Mary Dyer, uh, Zach, please. Okay, so this is a statue, which is actually here in Boston at correct? the State House. Yes, at the State House. And uh, tell us about Mary Dyer. Okay, Mary Dyer, my, my great-grandmother's name was Affie Dyer, and she died shortly after the birth of my grandmother. And what happened was that she was a... Uh, she was a, um, a like a rebel, like a religious rebel, yes. and she was like a. I think I don't remember exactly, but I think she was a Quaker, and I think she. What happened was she uh, she came back several times in, into the, the Puritans because she because she did, they didn't accept the authority of the Pope, of the Pope yeah. and that sort of thing. And what happened was that she, they she came back several times, and uh, they told her to stay away. They gave her every every reason not to come back because she was a religious rebel, like a religious prosecution yeah. by the Puritans. And she was and, actually. And she was actually hanged yeah. uh, for her religious beliefs. And for our viewers, uh, 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 for, for your history, the Puritans were people who had belonged to the Church of England, uh, and they were trying to purify the Church of England of the influence of the of, of the of the Pope and of Rome because they they didn't believe in the in the uh, authority of of the of the, of the Pope in, in Rome. And uh, uh, number five is another um, uh, Puritan woman, Anne Hutchinson. And uh, this statue also is at the state house. Yeah, she's another person who had religious persecution. Yeah, I mean she she had very strong beliefs, and uh, she uh, she was thrown out of the colonies. I think she was in down in Rhode Island. Yeah, and uh, she was involved with Roger Williams and that group down there. Yeah. And, they, and actually, what happened was they, some of the people from Massachusetts, I believe, went to Rhode Island because they wanted to get really get away from the Puritans. Right. And she kept coming back also. Yeah. And she actually didn't, she didn't get to get hanged, but she died. She was killed by Native Americans in New York State. Yeah, in what is now Brooklyn, I yeah. believe, according to your book. So, yeah. so she did manage to avoid the hangman's noose. She ran away to New York and... And was 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 killed by the Native Americans. Yeah, uh, so I, I feel very strongly about that because my I'm I'm really I'm a runner, so I really don't go to church on Sundays. But I, I do have, I have very strong personal beliefs, and yeah. I, I'm very proud of the fact that I'm related to martyrs that have statues at the state house. Yeah. And and one uh, one of the things that people are not uh, aware of, but uh, in the Puritan movement, the the women took a very, very active role, which is very unlike what the religious orders were back through history, where they were very male-dominated. The women uh, took a decidedly second place to the men in terms of the hierarchy and, the, and being teachers and, and, and priests and so forth. But in the Puritan movement, they took uh, Anne Hutchinson and, and, uh, and uh, Dyer, Mary Dyer, took a, a big role. Well, my wife's a teacher, so I feel strongly about that, too. Yeah. She's a teacher at St. Pius. And, she's a sort of like, and also my grandmother was a teacher, and she was actually bullied by some of our students had to retire from teaching wow isn't that incredible yeah, yeah. now let's look at uh, picture number six zach and and um richard tell us what we're uh, what we're seeing here okay that's this my is... dad in world war ii he was a veteran of world war ii he actually what happened was he uh he grew up in maine um back in uh, he was born 1916 mm -hmm. and he grew up in maine and uh, he, what he, what he did he grew up during the depression 
And uh, he graduated from high school, and he had he went to work at a uh, paper mill over in, ba- in a, I think it was Augusta, Bangor. I mean, Augusta, I mean, Bangor, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And what happens, he got, he got very ill one day at work, and he got rheumatic fever, and he was in bed for two years. And what happened was uh, when the war came up, the war effort came up, he decided to volunteer. And he uh, got in and he went and to... And he got in despite yeah. having rheumatic fever. Yeah, exactly. He's very weak and he went through basic training. And uh, he went over to um, Europe, I mean, eventually. He went with, uh, I think it was the 75th Division. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, what happened was he went over there and uh, battled, they got there kind of late in the war. They, they went from boats from England. They went all over the place. I think they went to uh, Cardiff. And they went mm-hmm. to um, a different Chicago for a while for Lee before he went over. And he went over there, and he was fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Bulge yes. And the Battle of the Bulge was a, a huge battle yes, late in the war. And my dad always said he served in the Rhineland. Rhineland's name for Germany. Right, yeah. And what he did, he told someone, he didn't talk much about it. But he, one time he told me a few stories. I actually wrote down the stories he told me about how he went over there, and how he served in the Montgomery and everything. And yeah. one night he was sleeping in a barn. And I guess they didn't have they didn't have regular uniforms. They had, like, play, white Blankets. Uh, I don't even know if I'm say white. He said blankets. And one night he was sleeping on a be- sleeping on in the barn. And he woke up in the morning. He turned over and he was sleeping on a frozen dead German soldier. Oh boy. Oh boy. And then okay. another time, I guess he was on a bench and that was dead frozen German soldiers. So he saw a lot. And he actually he um, actually served as a head of a PX in Paris after after the um, after the battles. Yeah. And he was a very shy, very quiet man, but a very strong man, a, yeah. a very strong moral conviction. Yeah. Um, Let's look at number seven then now. And I think this is um, um, this is your dad as well, right? Yeah, it's my dad as well. Okay. I think I'm not sure exactly where that is. But yeah. I think it's I think it's in France or Germany. Yeah. And let's look at number eight, uh, and uh, this was him working in the. Uh, that was my grandfather. Oh, I'm sorry. My, this is a picture of your grandfather. My grandfather was a cocker. Yeah, a cocker in Maine. And what it is, caulking is like a profession where you'll actually learn. It's like a skilled trade. And what you do is you take caulk and you seam the seams of wooden boats. Right. And uh, that's my dad that's also did be involved in that also. Yeah. I mean, my grandfather was very quiet. I mean, I never really got that close to him because he was a very heavy smoker. Yeah. And uh, but uh, but he was. I mean, but he did teach my father. My, I think the biggest influence of my father was my grandmother, Mary Foster Dressum, and she was a very strong influence as a yeah. teacher and, and uh, as, as such. Yeah. Now let's let's jump to number ten, uh, Zach. And uh, now this is you. And tell us who you're standing there with. Okay, that's Don Tabin. Okay, he was tell a, us about him. He was a world. He was a Pearl Harbor survivor. And what happened was we met through uh, through genealogy. I, mean, uh-huh. I met I met his daughter. He lived in East Boston. Yeah. And what happened was I I, found, I used to used to always work on Pearl Harbor Day. They used to have a ceremony. They had, still have a ceremony every year in the Charleston Navy shipyard. And uh, what they did is they uh, they actually I found my wife one day said well you know you should go to the uh, shipyard your cousin will be speaking and so I rushed down in my car I got to the gates and I walked in there and I had no clue where I was going I had never been in Charleston shipyard before and I, I drove in and I said oh my cousin Don Tabbitt speaking today and the guy says yes sir <laughs> you go right to the VIP VIP area yeah. and I got in there and I walked up to him and he goes I know you. Yeah, and, and he and he spoke. It was a ship called the Cassin Young was there, and then the uh, commandant, the commandeer for the uh, USS Constitution was there. And he spoke. And he talked about his experiences in uh, yeah. Pearl Harbor. Yeah. It was quite a speech. So he he was a survivor of that. Now we have a we have a picture number eleven, I believe, is a picture of the the uh, ceremony. This is the uh, 2012, and this this was the uh, uh, the program from that um, uh, from that. From that particular yeah, it was maybe maybe proud to be an American. Yeah. I mean, it was just it was just incredible. They had a uh, they had the ship there. I, think, I believe they had a flyover yeah. when I was there. They had some World War II planes. Keynote yeah. speaker Don Tabbitt yeah. and it's president, the Survivors and Friends Pearl Harbor Association. Yeah. So and and this was your this was your cousin. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, yeah, and yeah. Incredible. Yeah, he was incredible. just a, just a really nice guy. He's very down to earth. I mean, he talked right down to earth. And the funny thing is, he couldn't remember a lot of things. He was older when we had his program. Yeah. But he remembered every single detail about Pearl Harbor. I imagine that was burned into his brain, yeah, wasn't it? Exactly. Into his hard drive. Yeah, yeah. A- absolutely. 
And uh, now here's, we have a picture here. Tell us who this young, handsome lad is here, number 12. <laughs> uh, that's me. Yeah. I mean, I think that's probably my first grade picture. Yeah. I mean, back then I used to wear bow ties a lot. That's my first grade teacher. I was actually, I grew, I was born in Beverly in 1958. I lived on Dartmouth Street. Yeah. And then we moved to Danvers shortly afterwards. And I was at the Great Oaks School. And this, this is my first picture. I have one of the first pictures I have of me. There you go, handsome young boy with this with this tie. Now, one of the things that that struck me in your book, Richard, was was your honesty and straightforwardness. Uh, and I, we have uh, the next the next picture here, number thirteen. <laughs> this is actually, uh, and and you put this in your book, so uh, you know I'm not telling tales out of school. This was an actual fourth grade report card with teachers' comments. So along with grades, these this was a. So what 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 exactly were the te there's a there's a, a notation for April, another notation for June. So tell us what was going on here. What happened was uh, the teachers thought I didn't know whether I should behave as an adult or a child, mm -hmm. and I was very hyper and school. I still don't drink coffee. I'm kind of hyperactive. I talk yeah. fast. And they, did, they didn't like that. And they, they, thought I, they thought I should learn how to grow up. Uh -huh. And then they just, they made this comment. And my wife actually saw this and she was horrified. She says they would never say that nowadays. So, and yeah. because I had, I had HDH, I didn't, back then I didn't know that term. And I was very high. I actually stayed back in first grade. I used to be uh -huh. embarrassed by that because yeah. I was five years old in first grade. And I actually had a crush on one of the kids in my class. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't, but uh, one of the girls in the class. Uh -huh. And I, But uh, what happened was, I mean, they, when I was in elementary school, I went to Brown School in North Beverly, which is down by uh, the Cross and Second Congregational Church. Yeah. And the teachers were all young, well, young women. And they, I mean, I, one of my memories is going to, going to Brown schools. We used to go to the bathrooms and a woman would stay in the bathrooms as we, as we went to the bathroom to watch us. Oh, really? Yeah. It's kind of weird nowadays when you think about that. Yeah. Um, yeah but good. Brown School was a nice school. I mean, I remember... Uh, I went there and I, I was very shy, painfully shy. We used to go, we used to all walk to school together from Sonning Road, which is behind Flair's Cleaners. Yeah. And we used to go with the, we used to all walk together, all the kids, no one was driven. And then we'd, we'd go come back from school and we'd stop at the uh, corner store was Penny Candy. I and remember yeah, Penny Candy. And yeah. I remember you used to get mint juliops. I think it was either two or four for a cent. Yeah. And I remember we used to come home and that was a big thrill. We'd come home, get our bags of candy. Yeah. We'd go home, we'd play. We'd get home, uh, we'd get home from school. We'd go back outside and play till dark. Yeah. And we used to play like all sorts of games like kick the can, hide oh, and seek. I remember it well. And eventually I used to play uh, street hockey and eventually came on this hockey and came on to running. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about that. We're going to skip to number number 16. Uh, Zach, this is an actual, um, yeah, so Briscoe outruns, now you were with Briscoe, right? I was Memorial. Oh, you were in Memorial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so tell now. There's your your name is on the on the list. So tell us about this this meet. This was a big rivalry, right? Yeah, it was a big rivalry. It used to be Briscoe Memorial. That was the big thing. And Briscoe Junior High versus Memorial Junior High. And I was fairly new at this. I just started ninth grade. And this was, used to be seventh, eighth, and ninth grade to have teams. Yeah. And I and I ran. And back then, the big uh, star of the city was a guy named Rusty Rollins. His father was a ward counselor years ago. Yeah. He's a belly placeman, and he thought I'd just walk in there and win. And when I came in, he was eighth grade, I was a ninth grade, and I came in there and I, I actually took a wrong turn to course. Oh boy. And I, I still won by a lot. Yeah. And I was a city champion for, for, for the Beverly, <laughs> Beverly Junior High School. Now, in your book, you, you tell a very amusing story about how you, you, you discovered that you were a good runner. Tell us, tell us about that. Well, what happened was I was coming home from uh, junior, I think it was junior high, yeah. And uh, what happened was it was a bunch of bullies. And they, they were like, they were like um, I shouldn't say, I don't want to be insinuation, but they kind of had long hair. They smoked marijuana, which back then was a big deal. Yeah. And uh, they, there was three of them. And they, one time they beat me up one time from home to school. And another time, they, they were, I was walking on a track. You can't walk and try to well, back home. And I started running. Yeah. And I, I learned I could run. And you outran them. So you <laughs> said, hey, I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> yeah. so, so running. Now, we, we, have a, we have a picture, number 17, Zach, please. Um, 
And this is a recent picture. And, uh, oh, yes. and tell us who's in that picture. Okay, Roger Pierce on the left. He's a world-class sprinter. He ran for Fred Hammond back in the 60s. Yep. And that's Fred Hammond in the middle. He used to host a show on this cable network. And he was my history teacher, my mentor, and my home run, home run teacher. And you're a track coach. My track coach. Okay. So this was taken recently. And, uh, of course, we know Roger Pierce uh, in the red. Roger is, uh, uh, was on my show here. Mm. And uh, Roger not only was a track star when he was young and in high school, but he now is winning masters races all over the well, all the over world. the world yeah. and in the two hundred and the four hundred. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. Yeah, and and Fred Hammond, of course, uh, had his show Reflections here at BevCam for for oh a decade, um, and uh, we we love Fred very much. I stopped in to see him the other day, as you did yeah. at, at home. Uh, he's not too mobile these days, and there, and that's you there. Now, where where was the location? Where'd you take that? That was taken at the Hale House by the uh, I think it was uh, Abby or, or Susan Guggenin, the director of this. Bell oh yeah, Su Su Bell 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 yeah. And he yeah. was actually uh, selling his book. Fred was selling his book. I, yeah. we call, I call him Coach, but I call him Fred here. Yeah. And uh, he's he was my mentor. He's the one that taught me to. to I mean, got me into running. Really, he was a very strict Hall of Fame coach. And I, I was in his homeroom, and I remember I, I got elected class. My they, they used to have actually have offices for each individual classroom at Bellevue High School. Yeah. And I was in his homeroom. And I was my big his he was the side when I was voted vice president in my homeroom. Well. Wow. <laughs> and, and then also uh, he was a side because I was a, he was a history teacher, and I took the SATs for history. Yeah. And I got the highest point total in the school. Wow. Well. But I, did, I decided not to become a history teacher. I became an accountant because the proposition two and a half had just passed, and that was a big cost cutting effort for the school. Schools. Yeah, I mean, they, what they did is they capped property tax at two of two and a half percent of property values. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, increase every year. And what happened was they laid off all sorts of teachers and and people who work for the city of Beverly and all over all over Massachusetts. Yeah. So I decided to go into accounting instead. And but I never really loved accounting, but I I pretty much I pretty much worked so I could run. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a look now at number eighteen here. This is uh, the uh, Beverly high school track team and what year was this do you, would you say i'd say that's probably 1976 mm -hmm. i mean that might be i think that's the cross country team we had a pretty big team <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was funny because we lost one meet in my three years there, and we were considered a failure that year because we lost to Salem, and Salem was a state champion. Yeah. yeah. But uh, we also had an indoor track team, and in the indoor track team, we never lost a meet in three years in Northeast Conference. Yeah. Now, you got uh, you got into a little uh, uh, misunderstanding with Coach uh, Hammond because one year you decided not to run, but you decided to do what? Soccer. Soccer. I mean, I, I got sick of running. I, I could have been a captain of the cross-country team because yeah. I was one of the two fastest seniors. We didn't really have a strong senior class. The junior class was strong. And the sophomore class was strong. But when I decided, I decided to play soccer. I played soccer goal. I wasn't even a starter in my junior year. My kind. I used to run around. The, they used to run around the track, and they see me see me practicing soccer. And the coach, would, the people would all glare at me. And the coach would glare at me. Oh boy. <laughs> now, um, after now, you uh, you went to college. Yes. And uh, you you ran in college? No, I didn't no, because because I, I worked pretty much. I was in college. Yeah, I mean, I worked as a I, first. I worked. I first I was a busboy at Sword and Shield when I was growing up in high school. Yeah, and in the first couple of years of college, I was a busboy there. Yeah, and it was a beautiful place. It was like over oh, by a North Beverly. So I knew where the depot diner was. It used to be haiku, haiku after them. Yeah. And I was a busboy. And uh, that's kind of funny because uh, I was a busboy. And one time, I, I back then, I used to use my brother's license to get beer and not get beer and alcohol. Yeah. And one time, I, I had uh, too much cream to mint. Yeah. And then it was New Year's Eve. And I th threw up all over the place. And my dad <laughs> picked me up and he blamed one of the guys I work with for getting me drunk. <laughs> <laughs> That's not in the book, but uh, but uh, but that was another thing that happened to me there. But and also, I, I pretty much I went to Northeastern for two years. I wasn't actually quite fast enough. There used to be a guy named Bruce Beckford there. He's one of the greatest runners in the world. He ran for the track team. Yeah. So and then I took I ran, I paid my own way for college. I, my parents paid for the first semester in Northeastern. It was a co-op program. I worked for the Boston Globe in a co-op program. That was great. Yeah. I used to do all the uh, shows at Scholastic Fair, the Book Fair. Yeah. And I worked in the promotions department. With where the where the um, tour yeah. guides worked, and then you so, ran out of money, right? Yes, yeah, so I ran out of money, and I joined the military. I took a year off, and my, after my first two years, so. and I joined the military, and I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky, 
and that's right after they filmed Stripes. And I remember going through, uh, yeah, so they have something called, um, I forget the name of it, but you pretty much go through a station before you start, basically. And the thin biggest memory I have of that is they had, they had toilets sitting in the middle of the room with no stalls. <laughs> and they used to have a, and they had a sink. It was really gross in the morning. You see pretty, people, you'd be shaving, whatever, and they'd and they, <laughs> yeah. they give you crew cuts and all that oh, stuff. All right, we and, got that, yeah. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to fast forward here because we're, we're kind of running out of time. But I'm going to fast forward to uh, number uh, 22, Zach. Now, um, you were actually in the uh, running the Boston Marathon in 2013. Right. We're not going to tell everything about the book because we want people to. Now, in 2013, and you were headed, you were near the finish line or heading towards the finish line, and and the, the bombs went off, the terrorist bombs went off, correct? Yeah, yes, correct. And so tell us, tell us about that. What happened? How did you, you, your wife was meeting you at the other end of the... Well, what happened was, it's kind of, a, I'll give you a short version, it's kind of a long story, but what happened was in 2013, I ran for Wicked Running Club. I ran with another woman named Amber. And uh, we went and we were the bus to Boston. And I was, my goal was to run four hours in the marathon. And unfortunately, four hours was exactly the time the bombs went off. Yeah. And what happened was I had a bad day, luckily. And what happened was I, I was actually running through uh, Cleveland Circle. And one of the per per persons said to me, sir, are you okay? Do you need to get out of the race? And I kept running and I ran towards the Tommy Leonard Bridge. And all of a sudden, we were stopped. And all of a sudden, uh, we didn't know why. I mean, there was like there was a stop there, and somebody said it was a bomb. Somebody said it was an explosion. We thought it was a gas main exploding or something like that. A main yeah. cover exploding. Yeah. And what happened was uh, we were sitting there, and we had our cell phone, and eventually another, another bomb went off. And people I didn't realize, and people started crying. A woman started crying next to me, and it turned out that that was that's how we found out about the bombing. Yeah. Now you were supposed to meet your wife, Maureen, right? A a after you went through, finished, and yeah. so she was probably worried. Uh, so what, what happened there? And I what think we have another picture, uh, number twenty-three, Zach. I think this uh, this was actually is that you? That yeah, it was on New England Cable News. Yeah, and I you. think that's actually you with your and you were you were desperately trying to find your wife because you you never did get to the finish line down Boylston Street. They kind of just shunted you. Yeah, off I, I didn't know where she was because I, I didn't even bring a cell and phone. And she didn't know where you were. And, and so what happened was uh, she uh, she was near the finish line. So I, I actually walked. I was actually turning purple at at um, Tommy Leonard Bridge. I was too cold. And the woman that actually told me to write the book, write the memoir, she was there. And she said, "Rich, you're turning purple. You have to leave." You oh, can't Lord. stay here. Yeah. So I walked down the street parallel to the marathon finish line. And uh, the people of Boston, what happened was uh, I was freezing. And I, and uh, what happened was I, was I was running for my mother and I had the Canadian shirt, Canadian flag sh shorts on. People thought I was from Montreal. But anyway, I was walking down the street and then all of a sudden people started giving me water. Somebody gave me a blanket. And that's when I was walking down there. And I was very fortunate because I was walking down towards... Um, just beyond the finish, and there's these big school buses that brought your clothes there. And I don't know how it happened because there's a lot of school buses. I mean, there's a lot of marathoners. There were 30,000 runners. And they put your clothes in the bus so you can pick it up afterwards. And my bus was right at the corner when I walked down there. And I, okay. I knocked on the window, and they, they said, and I said, Can I, you give me my clothes? And they gave me some of my clothes, and I put them on. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was, listen, we were originally supposed to meet at the family meeting area, which is the area of alphabetically. By uh, around around the finish line, so I actually went down there. It's like a mile walk, and no one was there. But my wife was pretty smart. I mean, she's a teacher, so she said, "If anything emerged, and we know nothing about the bombing or anything," she said, "In emergency, we're going to meet at Boylston Street Station." Yeah, yeah. and it was kind of emotional. Well, and uh, we're we're almost out of time, but I would like to uh, show our viewers this is this is your book. There's a lot that we didn't cover, but. Um, uh, we're still running after all these years, uh, Richard Tabbitt, and these topics and much more about your life are uh, included. Now, we didn't even talk about you running for city office. You ran. Uh, and uh, before before we leave, I have something for you, uh, uh, Richard. This is a this is a copy of uh, the October uh, 1979 wow. um, issue of Runner's World magazine. I've had this for, well, 42, 43 years wow. uh, with a copy of, uh, with a Bill Rogers featured, who was the king of running there. And I'm, I'm going to give this to you. Well, and it, you it actually, much. 
reports my results that I ran the marathon the year before with a 310 time. Great. <laughs> and I want to give that to you. I've had it all these years, uh, but I, I, I want you to look at it. There's some great articles in it. I think you'll, being a runner back in that time, you'll appreciate some of the ads and some of the uh, oh, yes. some of the articles and, and, and things in there. Well, thank you. And then, uh, Richard, I want to thank you for, for being my guest today. Mm. Um, and uh, I want to thank our viewers for watching. Uh, you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.